Welcome back to our IB Physics video series. This is the second video in IB Physics Topic 7, Atomic, Nuclear and Particle Physics, where we will be looking at nuclear decay, types of radiation, nuclear reactions and radioactivity safety. In the previous IB Physics Topic 7 video, we ended on the concept of unstable isotopes. But what happens to such isotopes? Well, nuclear decay. Unstable isotopes are unstable because their composition of neutrons and protons cannot be held together well by the strong nuclear force. As a result, they decompose into lighter, more stable nuclei, but emit radiation doing so. This process is called nuclear decay, or radioactive decay. The amount of nuclear decay that occurs is termed radioactivity. This is officially defined as the number of decays occurring per second, measured in becquerels. These measurements are typically taken by a Geiger counter, and you should understand that radioactive decay is a random process. However, radioactive decay is constantly occurring around us, called background radiation. This comes from food and water, medical instrumentation, nuclear power plants, buildings and soil, space, and radon in rocks. This is why a Geiger counter needs to be zeroed before taking a reading of a material, to cancel background radiation. Despite decay being a random process, a Geiger counter can be used to determine the chance it occurs. This chance is described by the decay constant, measured per second. The decay constant can be used to determine an element's half-life, a property of a radioactive atom defined as the amount of time it takes for half the nuclei within an atom to decay. The IB expects you to be able to determine the half-life in an element, both graphically and algebraically. Let's cover each one now. A typical graph of nuclear decay plots the number of atoms, or radioactivity, against time. In this, we can draw a line at the point where half of the atoms have decayed, and use this to find the half-life. Note that a half-life compounds, i.e. if you're asked to find the third half-life of an element, you are asked to find the time at which one half of one half of one half of the initial undecayed atoms remain, i.e. one eighth. Because of this compounding, it means that the rate of decay is proportional to the number of atoms, i.e. it decreases as the number of atoms decrease. The formula for this is, the change in atoms over the change in time equals negative decay constant times the initial number of atoms. Let's do a practice question to put this into context. An unknown element is observed on an atom time graph as shown below. A. Write down the half-life of this element. B. Determine the decay constant of this element. For A, we can see that the initial number of atoms is 8 times 10 to the power of 30. So, half of this is 4 times 10 to the 30. Drawing a line to the graph and then down to the x-axis shows that the half-life is 6 hours. For B, we know that the formula is the change in atoms over the change in time equals the negative decay constant times the initial number of atoms. In part A, we saw that the initial number of atoms was 8 times 10 to the 30, and there was a loss of 4 times 10 to the 30 atoms over a period of 6 hours. First, we need to convert 6 hours to seconds, which is 6 times 3,600 seconds per hour, which is 21,600 seconds. Now, Substituting in the values on the change in atoms, the change in time, and the initial number of atoms, and then solving for the decay constant, we find it to be 1.2 times 10 to the minus 5 per second. Now that you know about the principles of nuclear decay and its quantification via half-life and decay constants, let's cover the three types of radiation. The three types you should learn about are alpha, beta, and gamma decay. For each, you must memorize the equation charge of decay and penetration depth. Alpha decay emits an alpha particle, i.e. a helium nucleus, from the nucleus. As a result, the general equation is given by the initial atom decaying to a new lighter atom plus a helium nucleus. Note how the notation of the new atom reflects the loss of the alpha particle, i.e. you subtract 4 from the mass number and 2 from the atomic number of the initial atom. Since an alpha particle is a nucleus, Alpha decay is a positive charge, and, since it's a large particle, it has low penetration depth. Beta decay emits a beta particle, i.e. a high-energy electron, and an antineutrino from a nucleus. 
It does so by converting a neutron into a proton. Antineutrinos will be covered in our third IB Physics Topic 7 video, so don't worry about them for now. As a result, the general equation is given by the initial atom decaying into a new atom, plus an electron, and an antineutrino. Note that the notation of the new atom reflects the conversion of a neutron to a proton, i.e. you add 1 to the atomic number of the first atom. Since it is an electron, beta decay has a negative charge, and since it is a smaller particle, it has an intermediate penetration depth. Gamma decay emits a gamma wave that drops the nucleus to a lower energy state. Since there is no change in the nuclear constituents, the general equation is given by the initial atom decaying into the same atom, plus a gamma particle. Since this is a wave, gamma decay has no charge, and since it has no mass, it has a high penetration depth. In addition to these properties, all three types of decay are ionizing, i.e. they remove electrons from matter exposed to their radiation. Alpha decay is the most ionizing, followed by beta and lastly gamma. The ionizing radiation is damaging to humans, as when DNA is ionized it can cause mutations, which can lead to cancer. Understandably, large-scale releases of radiation, such as the Hiroshima bombings and the nuclear meltdown of Chernobyl, thus increase cancer rates. Now that you know the types of nuclear decay, it makes sense to cover the two types of nuclear reactions. You've now reached the end of the preview for this IB Science video. If you want to check out the full video, head over to our website and select a membership plan today.